What I want to do today is really just set the stage. Come on, come on. Uh, you know, give me a little long enough to book them, I can live the world, right? So that was the first sort of, I think, use of technology, right? The notion of uh, uh, work equals uh, force times distance. Uh, so technology has been around a long time. And I looked up a definition of technology, and the top here is a you know, long, long definition, which, which, which you can read. But to me, simply put, we talk about techcon, well, what is tech? What is technology? Technology leverages or multiplies a person's physical or mental capability. That's what technology is, something that gives you leverage to make you more productive in the physical world, block and tackle, right? Of course, through a distance, Excel is probably a great example. Anyone here not use a spreadsheet like Excel? So I can tell you an interesting story. The predecessor to Excel was VisiCal. How many people remember VisiCal? Anybody? So I know the two founders of VisiCal. They were Harvard Business School. They were graduate students at HBS in 1977. The professor came up and presented this huge spreadsheet. We're going to go do this on a huge spreadsheet. They looked at each other and said, you've got to be kidding me. They went back and wrote visit a for two weeks in their dorm, and that started the whole industry. So they you know, we're not going to go do this with a calculator. We're going to get some leverage. My background, very briefly, I'm not going to go through all this. Uh, I, I, I think of commercial data processing starting in 1964 when IBM introduced the system 360. Uh, I wrote my first lines of code in 1967 as a, as a sophomore at Lehigh University. Loved technology, was in academia for a while, was at MIT, founded a company that was acquired by Lotus, that was then acquired by IBM, and I founded Golf Genius Software in 2009, which brought together my passion for golf. Don't confuse a passionate golfer with a good golfer. Uh, 30 years of IT experience and the fondness for large scale scheduling problems. So the first thing we worked on was some scheduling. I'm a geek, but I'm also a business guy. I've run businesses for, for 40 years. Uh, it, it, uh, I'm pretty good at it. Uh, and, and, and I enjoy the business side as much as the technology side. Uh, I also see the industry from inside. I'm very active at Marion Golf Club, a finance committee board member, treasurer. Uh, been very involved, I'm a member of a few other clubs. So I have a pretty good understanding of the business model for technology. So I'm going to call this the IT industry from a geek's perspective. Um, creative destruction, how many of you are familiar with the term creative destruction? Okay, it's a way of life, there's an economist called Jupiter that put this out, uh, that talked about how new technologies roll over old technologies, right? And people just get left in disarray. If you read the trade press today, or the, the press today, is a great example of, of, of that. Anyone know what that is? How many of you took Uber cars here? Right? So the taxi cab industry is getting crushed. If you owned a bunch of taxi cabs and you paid a lot for taxi medallions, you're not a happy camper. You know, that's creative destruction. Interestingly enough, uh, oftentimes the creative destructors violate a lot of laws and get where they work, which, which is what Uber did in other examples. Think about an IBM. We went from the mainframe, IBM owned that era, to the mini computer, deck owned that area, to the PC, Microsoft owned that area, to now web PC, which we talk about Google, Amazon, or the, or the bank stocks. Uh, we went from numbers to words to images to multi image video, right? So we've seen this constant progression of technology. And uh, you can't escape it. You cannot escape it. So I like to say to people when the industry turns left, you better turn left. Turn right, you're dead. Uh, the internet provides complete transparency, including pricing. Some of you have been as operators have been very upset about that. The seller's information advantage is gone, right? So it used to be, you walk in to buy a new car, you had no, you had no idea what the cost was, but the salesman would say, look, Mike, here's the invoice, and I'm gonna sell you this car for $20 over invoice. But he didn't tell you there was a $500 rebate on that invoice. That doesn't happen anymore, right? No one is going to walk into a car dealer not fully prepared, knowing the model, knowing the exact options, knowing exactly what the specials are. So there's no longer what we used to call the seller's advantage, the information advantage. Um, the internet that demonstrates that consumers want self-service and will pay for it. And I'll show some examples of this later. I call it the bus versus the bus driver. I'm in the software business. I want to rent you a bus. I want you to be the bus driver. Bus drivers are very expensive. We have a problem here. Just need to turn my I'm sorry. Turn your okay. That would help. Um, one of the things you're hearing me talk about is a strong understanding of the device versus the product and the total customer experience. And I'm going to challenge you to really think about this. How many of you are, are golf course operators? Good. So I'm going to challenge you to really think about this uh, as we start talking more about golf courses. What's the device, the thing, and what's the product? 
probably the best book in market I've ever read, 1985, a long time ago, Bill David Dow, in and out, in and intel, very well done venture capitalist. He said, a product is the totality of what a customer buys. When a device is augmented, or it can be sold by a salesperson, used by a customer, it's a complete product. Partial and incomplete products are the deviation of the marketplace. Remember when you would call support and they would say, what's wrong? And then they'd tell you to hit, you know, control shift swaps on your computer. That was an incomplete product, right? So having this understanding of the product versus device is very important. Clay, Rich Clay Christensen is a uh, professor at Harvard Business School, wrote a, a fantastic book called The Innovator's Dilemma, an un unbelievably good book, uh, recommended to anyone. And he recently came out with this notion of when people buy something, they're hiring that product. What are they hiring that product to do? When someone comes to your golf course, what are they hiring you to do? And the great example he uses in the book is milkshakes. So he was called in to one of the fast food chains to say, we need help selling more milkshakes. And he did a survey. He went to spend time. He found that 50% of the milkshakes are sold before 8 a.m. Wow. That's kind of surprising. So they did a study of why people bought milkshakes. The way he put it, why did someone hire a milkshake in the morning? And it's very, so I asked, you know, for example, what do consumers hire hot golf to do? And what do they hire your golf course to do? So where does golf, top golf fit? Well, to me, I think of golf as entertainment. They sell entertainment. Golf is a game. And golf is a professional sport. It's a professional sport. So most of us are in the golf as a game sir. Right? So you may hire things for different reasons. Um, industries that embrace technology grow, like travel and financial services. Others have died. We'll talk about creative destruction. We can all remember the video rental store down the street. How many of you have video rental stores down the street? Right? Netflix started out renting videos, but now it's all online. Incredibly successful company. Music streaming versus the record store. Amazon versus bricks and mortar. Um, there'd be no global airlines or global banks without, without IT, without technology. IT drives scale. It's what allows a company to grow and gain economies of scale and have a better cost structure than those that don't. IT shifts costs to the consumer and they like it. So some of you may remember the time you would walk into a bank to cash a check and they paid the cat, they paid their employee to give you your money. Now you walk up to an ATM and they charge you to give you your money. It's a really great business model. Good reason to buy the bank stocks. But it's true, isn't it? Isn't it true, right? It used to be that you, you would walk up and, and, and the teller got paid. Now they charge you. And one of their benefits is, well, if you do a lot of business with us, we won't charge you anymore to give you your money. <laughs> I, and one of the things that's haunted me, my wife and I played a lot of golf together. You know, we, were at, uh, we were in the Caribbean and had a really nice golf course. Really nice golf course. At a tea time, went in Sunday morning. And it sometimes happens there's a long line. Nothing to do about it. And then finally the guy behind me said, Jesus, there goes the driver. I thought to myself, so this course has a pissed off customer and lost revenue. Not a very good business model. Yet we know, you know, if you ever we know that lines will grow, and if you only have one person there, at some point you have too many people. Right? People would rather do it themselves. Why? How many of you checked in online? Flights. How many of you allow your customers to check in online? Fine. Right? Nothing wrong with that picture. Price transparency is bad for the seller, great for the buyer, but I'll go back to using airlines again. If you think about the airlines, and I don't know if this applies to the golf industry or not, airlines came under incredible price pressure because of transparency. Exactly the situation you face, right? So suddenly, you can go on the travel apps and you can go on to Expedia, and you're going to get a, a total view of cost. And so there's enormous, it amazes me sometimes when I look up the airport, I go, like, you can't pay for the gas if you fill the entire airplane, right? But what did they do? They then reduced cost by shifting the cost back to me, right? So first it was, well, I, can, I made a flight reservation online. I didn't call the reservation center. Then I printed my boarding pass online. I didn't call the reservation, I didn't, have to go to someone at the, at the airport. Now I print my labels at a kiosk further lower than the airport cost. And I like it this way. Right? Now maybe there's something wrong with me. I like absorbing their costs. How many of you like absorbing their costs? Right? Just rather do it yourself. 
I mean, I don't want the tension of getting to the airport and seeing long lines. I'd rather just do it myself. I do more and more of the work, and I prefer it this way. I honestly, I don't know how that applies to golf, but I think there's some things to think about. The technology experience is a larger and larger component of the total customer experience. And this is a really, really important point. Think about that airline. I took an American Airlines flight from Philly to Las Vegas. American Airlines cannot differentiate the in-flight experience. It sucks. They can't even differentiate the airport experience. It sucks, right? It's the same Boeing 737. It's the same food. They can't do anything about it. So where do they differentiate? They differentiate what happens before you get on the plane, and they differentiate what happens after you get on the plane. That applies to you. If you think about on the plane and walking up to the first day and leaving at 18, what do you do before someone plays? What do they do after they play? It's huge. It's huge, right? That's where people differentiate. And I, I see this in industry after industry. I happen to use Bank of America. I really like it. Why? Because they're online bank, right? I rarely have to go into a branch. I can, I can do all my online banking. I can scan checks. I can do ACH as one in three days. I can do wires. The only reason I can go into a bank is uh, to say deposit box, or quite honestly, sometimes people mistakenly send checks to my house instead of our company post office box. And if they're from Canada, I have to take them in. Right? Other than that, I never have to go into a bank. So I would ask, you know, can I make a reservation easily, check in easily, track bags easily, manage a loyalty program easily? Think total customer experience. What is the total customer experience you're trying to deliver some of the golf course? I had an interesting experience again with American Airlines a couple months ago. I never check bags. I hate checking bags. But it's hard to it's hard to take golf clubs carry them, right? They they kind of ended that a few years ago. So I was going somewhere at a conference to play golf, I checked my bags. Uh, I'm standing at the baggage claim, no bags. You've all had this experience, right? Blood pressure is going up. <laughs> no bags. And I realized, I got out my phone, I got on the American, American Airlines app, I went to baggage, I keyed in the bag tag number, and it said, uh, offloaded at this city 10 minutes ago. All is well. All is well. Right? Incredible, very easy service to do. Providing that sort of information makes a big difference. It's, to them, it's part of the product. So the device, getting on the airplane and getting to Las Vegas, you can't differentiate. One of the big problems you have in your industry, and I don't know how to solve it, is when people use online tea time services, it's like a golf course is a commodity. I can play this course for $30, and that course for $32, and that course for $29. All courses are different. How do you poke through that? Talk about those. You know, we all know there's, pro there's courses that are worth more than others. What's my time here? Um, here's some lessons I've learned over and over again, and one of them I, I chuckle every time I see it. New technology is first used to be more efficient than you're already doing. Hey, let's automate that task, right? We can get rid of some people, we can automate it, we're going to be more efficient. We're going to be more efficient. Then innovators realize you can do things you simply could not do before. And that's where the action is. That's where the real benefit is, right? That's when it really happens. The benefits of step two almost always overwhelm the benefits of step one. So in the early days of a computer, it was a calculator. Right? You put that in IBM system 360, you put it in an accounting system, it was a calculator. Well, think about that versus our world today of unstructured data, images, and social media. But the impact of that dramatically when I When I was at IBM, it might have been a big mistake. Uh, I, I worked in strategy with Lou Gerstner, and he concluded, and that's part I think he's right, he said you cannot be in both the business side and the consumer side. We're going to have to pick one. Well, back in 1995, it was very easy which one to pick. You picked the business side. Probably a mistake. Consumer over one, right? Now, on the other hand, HP tried to play in both. Got you got to be one or the other, but the consumer, think about it. Computers were not built in the 60s for consumers, right? Today, computing is all directed to consumers. The cell phone versus the iPod. How many people can remember when Motorola owned the industry with the clamshell phone? Anyone remember that? Then Nokia owned the industry with their phones. Then along came the iPod. And today, the iPhone is rarely used as the phone. 
I don't know if you've had this experience, but I have, I have a 16-year-old daughter. I called her one day. Dad, what are you, what are you doing calling me? <laughs> Dad, send me a text. <laughs> this is the world they live in. So we call it an iPhone, but it's not it's rarely ever used as a phone. From plastics to photography. So how many remember, remember the movie The Graduate? Great movie. Fantastic movie. Piece of, you, did you see the movie? You saw the movie? Right, sir. Son? Plastics. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Plastics. Right? This is 1967. That's a question that I saw in my college. Well, today is photography. Photo and video are now driving force in social media, right? Um, the, the statistics are staggering. YouTube has 10 billion views per day. There's about a billion photographs taken per day. To, a, to someone like my daughter's age, if it didn't get photographed, it probably didn't happen, right? Everything gets photographed. Um, and it's, it's become sort of the, cur the currency of the realm, if you will. Um, 1.3 billion users one, out of 7.4 billion population, 300 hours uploaded per minute. Photography drives so much of our world. Come along with the Gutenberg Press. If, if I owned a golf course, it's easy for me to say because I don't. If I owned a golf course, I would have some kid out there just walking around the course taking photographs of people and loading them up on a website and letting people download them because people love to see photographs of themselves. And as lousy as a golfer as I am, if you take enough photographs of me, there's going to be one where I actually look like I know how to play golf. It's about one in a thousand. So this kind of stuff is, is incredibly important. It's incredibly important. And it's, it's, it's all about creating that sense of community. Right? What everybody tries to do is create a community around their brand whether it's American Airlines or Bank of America or your individual golf course. You know, I had a call about a year ago, so we're by a tournament management system, we do live scoring. Uh, I got a call from a guy at, uh, at, a, at a very, very well-known club in New York. Pick up the phone, he says, hi, I'm the chairman of the golf committee at XYZ. I usually don't get calls from I, I, I deal with head pros, but I can do it. He says, well, I just want to tell you, when the idea came up of doing live scoring for our member member, I thought it was absolutely ridiculous. People loved it. Okay, thank you. It's going to be a buck coming after that, right? Thank you. Uh, he said, look, I'm a member of two other clubs. Would you mind if I introduce your product to them? Uh, let me get back to it. <laughs> but then he said, and this is a killer, he said, you know why, why people really liked it? <coughs> because on Sunday, when you brought your family and your young kids into the clubhouse, you looked and you said, that's my name on the live leaderboard. People love to see their name on that live leaderboard. And you realize it wasn't, so what was the product? Was the product live scoring? Was the product, you know, this large thing where my family, where I'd like, I'd like my family to, to see this? So have other sports grasped this? Have other sports grasped the technology? I would say yes, you know. I live in Philadelphia, so, and I'm not, in fact, I'm not a sports fan. Really not, um, but I, you know, I, I, I go, and, and you look at, say, when you go to a, a, a basketball game in Philly, it's entertaining. It's entertaining. We build a new, we build a new baseball stadium, Citizens Field, and people joke around. It's a food court connected to a baseball field, and it's designed so that people can just hang out in the food court, and it can be really good food or just a dog and ride, right? So think about that. It was built as a place for people to congregate. Because if you want to watch a baseball game in Philadelphia, where is the best seat in Philadelphia to watch a baseball game? Oh, on your TV at home. So why do you go to a baseball field? They don't care. It's all TV. It's all advertised TV revenues. They really don't care if they show up or not. Because people want to be with other people who do what they like to do. Golfers like to be with golfers. My best friends, I spent time at IBM, my best friends from the IBM days are people who play golf together. We're all technologists, my best friends are people who enjoy golf. <coughs> so people come to these things, again, because they want this sense of community. So if you think about the golf industry, it's, 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 it has it grasped technology. And I hope this doesn't upset anyone, but I would say golf is entertainment top golf, absolutely. It, it's a technology company. Packages, entertainment. I've never been to one. 
You go tomorrow night, I'm looking forward to it. How many of you have been to Top Golf? Everyone tells me it's fantastic. You know, is there a lot of crossover from Top Golf to the golf game? I don't think so. But how would I know? Right? I've never been to one. Who am I to speak to that? Um, golf is a professional sport, i.e. the tour. Right, fantastic technology. Fantastic technology. It's very, very well developed. In fact, if you think about your golf course, it's really been, in some ways, technology-based for a very long time. Toro is a technology company. John Deere is a technology company. Agronomy is a science. Golf clubs are modern technology. Golf balls are modern technology. So you're surrounded by a lot of technology, but for some reason, it hasn't been adopted at all. And having said that, we see enormous uptake for our product, so I think people, people are stepping up to it. But you know what, what I've tried to do here is just lay out a, a broader way to think about technology. And what I'd ask you to think about is, why do people come to your golf course? What are they looking for? A piece of it is to play golf, but I think they're looking for something much larger. If you can figure out how to serve that, there are a lot of uh, significant revenue opportunities, which we'll be talking about some of these other sessions. I picked up some time for our colleagues here. With that, I thank you. We have a couple minutes. If anyone has questions, we're glad to answer them, but I think they're fine. Any questions? Okay. Thank you very much.